<laughs> Danny <laughs> McNamara from Embrace, how are you? Welcome to Virgin Radio Classic good. Album. Yeah, exciting. How does it? How does it feel calling it a classic album? Well, I'm uh, sure it's not the first time Embrace called it a classic album. <laughs> uh, I've never called it that. Um, other people do. Uh, it's nice, you know. I mean, it's 20 years ago now, so... Shut up, it's not. It's three yeah. years, surely. <laughs> yeah. The 90s was yeah. only 10 years ago, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, it's a little bit scary that it is that long. I was talking about it um, to someone a, an hour or so ago, and um, a lot of the people I was talking about are dead now. It's like... Yeah, that's awkward. Yeah. A lot yeah. of casualties. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of... Yeah, it's, it's good to be just breathing. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. So take us, take us back. So 1998 it, it, uh, is when it came out, but you'd been, I guess, in the public eye for what, a good 12 months before that, yeah. easily. Yeah, yeah. Um, take us back to when you first started, so, you know, in the, in the yeah. old rehearsal oh rooms. Oh, my God, yeah. Well, I mean, we'd been going for about eight or nine years before we got a record deal so um you know we started on my brother's 18th birthday so wow. that's like 30 years ago nearly now and so. you, you used to do it under all different names then oh uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah we had some really cheesy names uh christiana f um the bus conductors is the worst one i think Christiana F sounds quite good. I mean, I yeah. mean, she sounds wonderful. Yeah, I think it's named after a film. We were trying to be cool, but um, I haven't seen the film, so. And I mean, it's difficult to, because the scene is so different now yeah, in terms yeah. of how bands are made and and kind of formed and signed and 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 kind of do well. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of difficult to explain to kids actually back back in the day. Which, which yeah. sounds bad in itself, that yeah. you could just start a band in a rehearsal room and yeah. be good and get signed, and yeah. just through kind of sheer hard work. Yeah, there wasn't any uh, social media or anything like that, so um, if people wanted to know about the band, they had to come and see us. Yeah. There was all sort of, the, the thing back then was, are you going to go down to London to do a showcase yeah. and stuff? And Got to hire a coach. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and we wouldn't, we were really cocky about it. We said, no, we're not. If they want to see us, they can come and see us. And mm. And they did, which was great. Yeah, yeah. The unfortunate thing is that first gig that we did in front of the entire music industry, we really sucked. <laughs> it's always the way, so, though, isn't it? Yeah. Always the way. So then the second gig, uh, it was half full, and then the third gig was sort of, you know, even less people. But uh, fortunately, uh, David Boyd from Hut um, saw us, and he loved it. He uh, ran at me from sort of my peripheral vision. He's got long blonde hair, and I thought, or he did have then, he doesn't now. I thought it was like some uh, woman running at me. And I was, looked at him and, and he kind of has this like really masculine face, yeah, which yeah, kind yeah. of shocked me a bit, sort of Benny Hill style, you know. Because at the time, Hut were, Hutt were about as cool as it got. Yeah, yeah. They, they, Smashing uh, Pumpkins. Yeah, they had Placebo, Verve, Smashing Pumpkins. Um, yeah, so it was basically, we were going in all these record companies and um, telling them that we didn't like anything that they were doing and it was all rubbish. And then we went into Hut. Um, and I was still really cocky about it, but um, it really felt like home. Like he took us up through the Virgin building and into the loft, which yeah. is where Hut used to be. And yeah, there was just yeah. all this vinyl, and it was like a sort of hippie commune or something. And uh, and I just thought, oh, it's these. And then we cancelled all the rest of the meetings. It was like I don't want to see anyone else. It's these. It's definitely these. And nice. He, he we still, you know, I still see him now. And um, I saw him a couple of weeks ago. Um, uh, yeah, well, presumably, were they just coming off the back of Urban Hymns? Was that, uh, that, that no, it was before was that. Was it before yeah, Urban yeah. Hymns? Yeah, we, we got um, a record deal before uh, the Verve sort of started their comeback. Um, I think I think Richard Ashcroft was still like doing demos and stuff. I don't even think they'd even got back together wow. when, when we uh, started releasing our EPs. Must have been an exciting time. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> It's pretty insane, like all the sort of front cover of all the magazines, because there was a few magazines back then, they're all yeah. gone now, like yeah, Enemy yeah. and Melody Maker, and oh my God, I'm starting to feel really old. <laughs> it's quite, this is quite a depressing show, by the way, just <laughs> yeah. we'll get through it. <laughs> yeah. um, Someone comes and gives us a vitamin drip halfway through. Just... <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, yeah, and, and, yeah, and we were like all over radio, um, like Radio 1 and the stuff. Hype around the band was phenomenal. I don't think I'd yeah. seen, in fact, a previous classic album was, was Suede's first album. Yeah. There been, you know, there was huge hype around and ex expectations around that. Yeah, we were sort of the one after them, yeah, I yeah, think. Yeah. yeah, there was like Ride and then Suede 
and then us, and then I think after us it was maybe Gomez, maybe. Yeah, yeah. And then the Strokes, and then yeah, you know, yeah. So there was always like one band that everybody raved about back then, and. and I mean, you courted it, you know. You guys, you, you weren't, you weren't, you weren't backwards and coming forwards. Well, we, I mean, we had no idea what we were doing. That's why. I mean, we were just like five northerners, and and uh, we'd been telling people that we were going to be the best band in the world for nine years, you know. And, <laughs> and no one just gave, gave a flying, you know. <laughs> and then suddenly, there's a microphone in front of you, but you're still shouting down the megaphone yeah. because of all the, you know, uh, apathy that you're surrounded by. Um, and then suddenly you see it in print, you know, we're going to be better than the Gallaghers, we're going to be better than, you know, whoever you want to throw at yeah, us. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I mean, I genuinely did believe it. I, I thought I thought that we were in some ways. Um, and, you know, and even now as a sort of guy who's like 47, I still think that we're the best at being embraced. You yeah. Know? Which is probably what I should have said back then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know the 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 the, uh, the, the complexities of youth, the exuberance it was, it, of youth. It was sort of that Jesus and Mary chain kind of, um, and also like the Stone Roses kind of thing, where it's like nothing that's around at the moment is doing what I want it to do. Yeah, it's sort of some stuff gets close, and almost in a way that's more frustrating because you're like you love some of the stuff they do, and then they do something, and you're like, oh, that's not that's not right, and you almost like as a fan. Yeah. You get really critical of the stuff because you love it when it's right. So, you know, I, I you know, obviously like I like bands like PJ Harvey and Ride and Suede and mm -hmm. Stone Roses and all all those sorts of bands and stuff. But I, I just always I just always felt like there was something more to bring to the table. Yeah. And I was frustrated that they weren't doing it and you know, yeah. it's that really. Yeah, the way Which is a creative place, but when you put it in big uh, Well, from quotes, a business point is... of view, you sort of gap in the market. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, it just sort of all, you know, the Britpop stuff all felt really sort of shallow and kind of... Uh, there wasn't much depth to it. I mean, I mean, you yeah. could argue, I mean, maybe someone like Pulp. Yeah. Pulp had a bit of depth and a bit of substance to it, but you know, there's yeah. the whole kind of, I guess. But even that was sort of ironic and knowing and sort of yeah. clever, clever. And I, I sort of came from like bands that were much more wholehearted about it. You know, I mean, the first thing that I sort of fell in love with musically was Elvis when I was like six. Mm. And he just used to go on stage and just give and give and give and give no matter what, you know, he was there. Yeah. There's no irony there, you know. I think a lot. Well, a lot of bands were afraid of writing about love as well. I think, yeah. you know, like Jarvis was good at writing about about some right old dirty shagging. I mean, I love those bands. Yeah, yeah. You know, now, but back then it was just very different from what we were doing. You know. And you know, we'll come on. To, we'll start off with all your good, good people. Which I, I th by the time, by the time you'd recorded it for this album, how many times? Had, how many times uh, yeah, did we you recorded it? We did it as a demo. Well, I mean. We did it as a really early demo, which had a rap as the verse, would you believe? Holy. Yeah, I'm not going to do that. Wow. I mean, does that still <laughs> exist anyway? Have we, have we still got yeah, that? Yeah, there'll so... be a demo somewhere, yeah. Um, and then, yeah, we did the, the proper demo, uh, which ended up coming out on Fierce Panda. Yeah. And then we recorded it again for the single, the EP, and then we recorded it again for the album. Wow. So, yeah. Well, why, why did you keep changing? Were you just continually not happy, or the budget got, get, kept, kept getting better? Um... Well, we were happy with the uh, the single version, but um, Youth, the producer that we got in right at the end, we were really burnt out doing the album, mm. and uh, got to the end, and I was just I was just running on vapors, and we got Youth in to come and mix it, and also record a couple of tracks, and yeah. he did. Uh, all Google people, he wanted to re-record it again, and we were like, why, you know? And yeah. he was like, no, I want to change the drum beat and a few other things, and we were like, no, we don't want to, and. He, he we won. got argued with and he won, <laughs> yeah. And he also recorded Come Back to What You Know. Um, so yeah, we did we did record it quite a lot. Um, but the first time I ever remember getting really excited by it was um, when we did the demo. It actually has like another sort of couple of minutes on the front of the original demo. Um, and we gave it to this guy in London called Ott to mix. And Ott. We'd, Ott. And we'd never, we'd never had anybody interfere with our stuff. So I just remember speaking to my manager on the phone and I was like, 
if he messes this up, I'm going to go around there. I'm, I'm going to find, where does he live? Tell me where he lives. And I was all like ready to go down and lamp him. And my manager just said like, just, just. Not, even, not even sent to you. Yeah. I, you know what I mean? Just like, see what he does first. You know, I was like, you know, I just, I didn't like the idea of letting it go to somewhere else, yeah. you know, because we were very, very controlling. And, you know, because we just, we didn't believe anybody else knew what we were trying to do. You yeah. Know? Um, and then we went down. And there's this guy, and he's deaf in one ear, he's up. That's just, which is a good start. <laughs> yeah. He mixes mono everything. Mix. Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. Um, and uh, he stuck it on, and, and it was just incredible. Straight away, I was like, oh, my God. He'd taken all the front off, and he'd, yeah. done, he'd done loads of stuff with it, and it just was like, wow. And um, I remember Jazz, our manager at the time, and Tony, our other manager, and they were, everybody was there like, okay, this is going to... Was, yeah. That was a bit of a you Yeah, moment, yeah, yeah. This is going to be big. Because um, the demos that we'd done before that, which got us a record deal, had some of the songs uh, that ended up on the Goodwill Out, but that was the sort of the, the one where everybody thought, oh, this is a game yeah, yeah. changing. You know? Do you remember writing it? Was it, was it you or your brother? Um, sort of a combination of both of us. We had the chorus for a really long time. Um, and maybe about three years or something, yeah. and just all these different verses and none of them were working. And um, I was actually at a placebo concert when I got that first line, I feel like I'm at something. Because um, th there was sort of a fuss around them just after us, it was sort yeah. of around that same time, and they were signed again to Hut. Yeah. And I went to see it and I thought, yeah, this is, this is happening. Yeah. And, and I got that line and then it just all sort of, um, really quickly followed from there. Well, let's have a listen to it, shall Yeah. Here we go. Welcome back to Virgin Radio Classic Albums with Danny from Embrace. Uh, that was all you good, good people. That's that sounded huge. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, we do our best. I mean, the, the album. I mean, the one thing that struck me listening back to it after all these years was there, it was a period of time in music where, particularly British bands, had this habit of whenever they did the big gig, they'd wheel out a couple of trumpet players to stand in the. <laughs> do you know what I mean? For, for like one or two songs. Yeah, yeah. It was always like it. Blur did it quite a lot. Yeah, you know, yeah. Oasis did it. Kind of, uh, and and a lot of bands did it. But like, all of your songs, it's it's pretty yeah. much orchestrated the whole album, isn't yeah. it? Apart from apart from two or three tracks. Yeah. Was yeah. it? Was that always the plan? Was that what was in in the in the? Um, it was really weird because. Um when we did that, we, like I said, we did it in a, in a small studio in Huddersfield, in the red light district in Huddersfield called Beaumont Street with this guy called David Crefield. And we'd got some demo money from London Records, just enough to like do like three days. Yeah. So we recorded um, that. And uh, it was all done except for the strings and the horns and stuff. I had an idea of what I wanted the horn line to be, so yeah. I sort of sang that. And Mick, who wasn't in the band at the time, he was just a friend. Uh, we rang him and uh, we said, you've got half an hour because we're in a rush. <laughs> yeah. You know, studio clock. Yeah, yeah. No, and I was knackered because I'd been, I'd been up for like 20 hours straight or something working on stuff. I was under the desk doing lyrics or wherever. I just yeah, yeah. wasn't getting any sleep. So I was like, I'm just going to go get my head down for half an hour. Otherwise, I'm going to be no good to anyone. Yeah. When I come back, you know, that's how long you've got. And he was doing it on Cubase, which is oh, a God, really I remember that. computer yeah. program. Um, and I, I think I gave him 45 minutes and came in and it was like that. Wow. <laughs> All the entire thing done, and it sounds exactly like that. And um, even back in those days when you didn't really have very good samples, he'd managed to make it all sound like that on a keyboard with Cubase. Fantastic. And uh, I was like, yeah, that's done right next. <laughs> Just didn't even, you know, didn't Fantastic. even have a chance to sort of take it in. But you'd but, found, that, that was the kind of, that you'd found your sound there, hadn't you? Um, it, was, it was down to uh, Mick, a lot of it. Um, because I had a lot of songs that were sort of really intimate, small songs that I'd written on an acoustic guitar that didn't really sound very good as a band. Mm. And then when we got Mick involved and he brought all the sort of keyboards and strings and stuff, it's like, ah, right, okay, I can see how this can work and that can work. Yeah, yeah. And, 
and things started going into place. Um, but the, the first sort of time that I thought we had it was a song called Retread. Um, and uh, it was my brother Richard who found it on a tape. I'd given him a tape. Kids, that's uh, it was a cassette. Yeah. They won't know what a tape is. Well. You used to have to put a pencil in it <laughs> to rewind it. <laughs> this is so bad. <laughs> um, yeah, and I gave him a tape, and he put the tape in the wrong way around and played what was on the other side, and it was just me, like, singing to myself. Yeah. And he found this song called Retread, and he was like, what's that? And I was like, oh, I'm just, you know, just singing to myself. And, and he said, yeah, well, I really like it. I was like, mm, it sounds a bit like Tammy Wynette or something. It's a bit country and western, I don't know. It doesn't really sound like yeah. us. And he said, yeah, but well, what do we sound like? We just sound like all our influences, like Echo and the Bunny Man and The Cure and U2 and all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, and he's like, oh, OK. And he put a uh, guitar line on it, and I wrote some words to it, and suddenly it was like, ah, right, OK. This is us. Yeah. This is what we sound like. And that's, I stopped. How you, that's how you find it, isn't it? Yeah, and I yeah. stopped singing like Ian McCulloch because I <laughs> just used to do basically an impression of Ian McCulloch. Yeah. Um, pretty much identical. Um, that's a confidence and, thing, though, isn't it, more than anything? Um, I just loved Ian McCulloch <laughs> and I could sing like him, so I thought, yeah. And, and you do, you just, when, you, you know, when you're a kid, that you, you do, you sort of copy the stuff you love and yeah. then as you, as you get older, you kind of, you make it your own or you grow into your own thing and... Um, yeah. Uh, Talk to me about lyrics. So next one up is uh, my weakness is none of your business. Yeah, so yeah. where's I mean it's a great line. It's a great line. Yeah, that that's um, there's a story behind that. Um, there's a song. Thank God for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's there's a song by Michelle Gale uh, called My Sweetness. My sweetness is, is, is your weakness. weakness. Yeah. yeah. Michelle, yeah. I've met Michelle. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, I I I listened to that and I. And I, and I just came up with my Hang on a minute. You're saying that the indie anthem, My yeah. Weakness is None of Your Business, yeah. was influenced by Michelle Gales. Yeah. Yeah. My Sweetness it is Your Weakness. It absolutely was, yeah. Michelle, yeah. if you're listening, <laughs> well done, Gail. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'd had this sort of, sort of Leonard Cohen verse for a while, and this sort of call and response uh, chorus sort of, you know, one half was going to be sung by someone and then the second half was going to be sung by someone like else. Like Kumbaya, yeah. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then I just, I, 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 I was listening to that song quite a lot and, it, and, I, and I just came up with that hook and then suddenly it was like, all oh, right, wow. And it was originally just done as the B-side for the Fierce Panda of My right. um, Good Good People. Okay. And uh, the record company were like, you're putting this out as a B-side, are you like, I was oh, we've got loads. I was just so cocky. <laughs> <laughs> you almost win, easy, I can you? see you wincing when you're kind of saying the things like, that you used to. Yeah, I've been... I kind, I, I kind of love it. I'm kind of glad. Yeah. There's, there's something really pure about about it. We, we didn't sort of play the game in a way. Although no, you, you didn't. could see it that way, but we really didn't. We were just like we just said what we thought. And I was traveling. Just... I, was, I was traveling. I was traveling back uh, from somewhere last last night and doing a bit of research. And it's kind of like and if you Google Danny Embrace, you just come. There's a cacophony of uh, <laughs> kind of, of quotes, which is just like it's like a Wikipedia flicking the V's up the rest but of the I've, music. I mean, world. you know, like I mean, I'm just like this. I was always like this. I'm yeah. still like this. I mean, you know. I, you, you, you could probably it, find a quote. It, it didn't from, come across. It didn't come across as belligerent. It just yeah, came yeah, across yeah. as someone who was just actually one hundred percent, completely and utterly, utterly believed in what they were doing. Yeah, I yeah I do. I still do. Yeah. You know, and kind of you know even our new album, um, it's more instinctive than we've ever been, and 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 the crowds are still there for us. You know, yeah. it's, it's so it's you know I mean. In some ways, I was right. You know, I mean, I think idealistic and um, naive, but um, I guess when that that naivety kind of pulls you through a lot of the, exactly, a lot of the crap yeah. that you have yeah. to get through. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, because you otherwise of, you just sink. Yeah, the naivety about the journey that you've got to go on is what sort of gives you the balls to take the journey. Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, there's definitely a lot of that. So back to back to lyrics. So you, yeah. so Michelle had, uh, had, had kind of dinged, yeah, sprinkled the, some magic yeah. fairy dust on on the title. Yeah. And then do you how do you how, what's your writing process? Do you kind of oh, do, you, do you have a yeah. kind of thing in your mind? Did you is it a mood that takes you or? Um, do you know what? I just used to just sit there with a the guitar and just like um, wall of attrition, just not ever give up until yeah. I got something. And and you could be like days and weeks and sometimes horribly, sometimes you could be months and yeah. not get anything. Do you always have to finish a song? 
Or do you chuck them um, away? You can't. Do? Like, I mean, you know, you can't. I mean, it's just, it comes to you in dribs and drabs. I mean, sometimes you get a full song, mm. but more often than not, you'll get like a really great verse and the chorus is rubbish or vice versa. So you can't dictate, it comes when it wants. But yeah. the feeling that you get when, you, when you've got one, um, it's really weird. Like, I, I, I actually physically shake. Uh, which is, I don't know whether it's a nervous response or like I'm going in a shock. Or, well, when you're writing? When, when I get something that's right. really good, I'll, I'll like literally be like, you know, really tense and my voice will, you know, sort of, I go into this sort of really shaky yeah. zone. And then, um, you know, for instance, so I like, I'll, it'll be like three o'clock in the morning and I'll, I'll ring people and be like, I've, I've got this song. And in order to um, ring them, I'd have to like put a duvet over my shoulders and like lean against the radiator just to stop myself from shivering. So it's the adrenaline. So I can uh, maybe it is yeah, that. It is maybe, adrenaline, yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't get it anymore so much, but I used to a lot back then. I don't know whether I was just like pushing all the excitement down yeah, or yeah, whatever, yeah. but and I'd just be like literally shaking. That's great. At least at least you know when you at least you know when yeah. you've got it because it's and you yeah, and then and then your mind starts racing. You start thinking like. Oh god, I can't wait for people to hear this. Like yeah. my my brother's usually the first person I think I'm gonna tell, and then you just want to tell the world, and then and then you're thinking, oh, I can't wait to play this live, and mm. then uh, you know, and then it goes away again, and you know, you might be weeks or months again, and and but for that sort of minute, it feels like I've got a purpose. Like this is the reason I'm here, and there's like this enormous feeling of like, ah, this is why I do it. This is, and it's really easy. Why, you know? And it feels, you know, there's like a, I don't know what it is, like a moment of flow or transcendent or whatever. You just get like a moment where you're like, everything makes sense, and you feel amazing. And then about five minutes later, you're back to just, you know, and you I keep you keep playing it to try and pretend you've just come up with it still. Yeah. And then it just goes away and. Now it's an old song. Well, let's get let's let, let's let's get <laughs> let's, let's sit against the radiator with a duvet over our heads <laughs> yeah. and listen to uh, my weakness is none of your business. Because my Welcome back to Virgin Radio Classic Albums with Danny from Embrace. How are you? I'm very good. We just heard uh, My Weakness is None of Your Business. That's the second off the second, album. Second, yeah, on the so, English version, yeah. I mean, a lot of, the, a lot of this, this programme will be taken up. We heard Fireworks, we heard All Your Good, Good People, and, and, and next, Come Back to What You Know. It's kind of, yeah. There were the, the, I mean, the, 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 <laughs> the sheer balls of putting those three tracks back to back yeah, at yeah. the top of the album yeah, yeah. Was, 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 pretty, was, was quite something. <laughs> Yeah, I remember when we when we wrote "Come Back to What You Know." Um, again, it was sort of the middle of the night, and um, we'd released "Oh Good Good People," and that had done really well. I think it got to like it went top ten, I think mm. number eight or something. Um, and we didn't really th we didn't really have a single look to follow it. We sort of thought we've got one after that, but we need another one. Mm. And uh, Jazz, who was our manager, one of our managers at the time, was like, "You know, if you got anything." And I was like, mm, not really, no. And so we were like desperately trying to get something. And I got it again about three o'clock in the morning and rang him. Again with the duvet on. Yeah. <laughs> Jazz, I've got it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I sang him, the, sang him it from the beginning and he stopped me. Uh, after I got past the first verse, he stopped me and went, is that the chorus? And I went, no, no, that's, that's the verse. He went, Oh my God, okay, go on then, carry on. <laughs> so I played him the rest of it and then I got to the end of the chorus. He goes, is that the chorus? I went, yeah, that's the chorus. He went, oh my God, it's got two choruses. Amazing. And he was like, really like, he was like massively excited. I think he sort of put the phone down, went over to the other side of the room and like shouted and then came back. And wow. this is a guy who's like 60 who discovered like Wham and- Yeah, you yeah. Know. Jazz Summers, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and 
you know, he's such a, a presence, a really charismatic guy. Um, and, and to have that reaction, being the first reaction that I had when I wrote the song. Um, that must feel quite cool. Yeah, you know, I mean, rest his soul, he's dead now. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, yeah, he, he, lived he was a real character. He, he did live the dream. Yeah, totally. He did. Don't know whose dream. It was very much, very much his dream. Have you read his book? Yeah, it's an Big amazing Life. book. Oh, yeah, it's it's one incredible. of the best books I've ever read. It's fantastic. Um, but when it when it came to putting the album together and sorting out the track listing, was there was yeah. there was there a temptation just to kind of like drip feed the big uns throughout? Because because you, because you clearly didn't. I I used to uh, I'd go into the record companies, I would, into the record company and and. Like who had the bosses of Virgin and Virgin had EMI, I think at the time. That's right, and everybody yeah. had bosses, and their their bosses had bosses. And I was like, just get them all in a room. I want to speak to them. <laughs> <laughs> I did. So I got. I think it was Ray Cooper, and I can't. I can't remember all their names, but there was like all these big bosses at Virgin and, and EMI and their bosses, and we stopped. Because you're the hot ticket at the time. So yeah. You can pretty, but you can do that. I, then. I did. Yeah. yeah. And, and I was. <laughs> And I, and I got a whiteboard out and I drew them what the album was going to look like. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I had a track list and we hadn't written it yet. Yeah. Uh, just like some of the tracks were just shapes. Yeah. And there's this really big one where we all, you know, we all sing and like it's a big crowd. And then this is where there's a big string into and I just sort of abstract concepts about how, what it's going to be. Yeah, yeah. Or like a sonic map. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy, like, yeah. Um, and it, the album in the end isn't that far away from that. Yeah. <laughs> so did you? So did you? It's mental. So you were definitely thinking of the album as a as a, a, as big a listening sort of wave. experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. Because it, it's bookended by the big anthems, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it's sort of. Yeah. I, I, can't, I can't explain what my reasoning was back then. I just we wanted some sort of more rocky stuff in the middle, a big sort of la la at the end. Mm. Yeah, it was really instinctive and primal and, and, and not very thought out. Who were, you, who were your peers at the time? Ah, uh, God. Uh, you know, I mean, who, who were you kind of like, who were you jostling against? Well, everyone by the sounds of it. But, but. I didn't really think about it like that. I honestly didn't. I, I always just thought that if you're good, you make your own branch on the tree and yeah. you don't have to fight with anyone else. I mean, there was a lot of stuff in the press because we were Northern Brothers about the yeah. Gallagher Brothers and stuff. Right, you know, I mean, the Bee Gees are brothers and the Proclaimers are brothers. I always thought that was a really crazy. Bee Gees and the Proclaimers hate each other, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, you know. Yeah. <laughs> they're sick of being asked questions about oh, each mate, other. Oh, mate, they get you off. It's yeah, a nightmare. But, <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't really, you know, I didn't, I didn't get it at all. Um, and obviously, you know, they were able to get quotes off me about it. Yeah. You know. <laughs> you, you were, How many do you want? Because <laughs> Noel, well, Noel was, rubbish, Noel was you know? at the other end, kind of giving, yeah, yeah, just keep firing. Yeah. I, mean, I, I know, I know Liam. I've met him a few times, and we get on really well. He's he's a really nice guy. Um, but I it paid. That, it worked for both of you, didn't it? At the time, you know, that was it was that was that was what made the that was what made it so exciting. Well, I remember, I remember one night going out for a drink with this guy who uh, was one of Liam's best mates, and. Uh, it was some hotel in London, I can't remember which one. A lot of cocktails. And he sat there and he was like, everyone's waiting for you to fail, mate. This is just before the album came out. Right. Like, the whole world is waiting for you to fall now because you've set it right up. Like, all the press, all, all the radio's always playing you. Everyone just wants you to fall now. Yeah. So your album better be absolutely amazing, otherwise you're screwed. But it was a risk, though, wasn't it? I mean, you know, because you, because you, because it wasn't wrong. Because, yeah, because yeah. Because you, you can't... I, I, that terrified me. I, I went home. I was, I was sleeping on someone's floor on Oxford Street, and I drew all the curtains, and I didn't want to go into the studio. We, mm. we were literally. It was the last week or last couple of weeks of the studio, and it's when youth came in to rescue us. Yeah. I almost had a nervous breakdown. My manager had to come. And he lived in Stevenage. I had to come to Oxford Street, come upstairs, and I was huddled in, in bed. That duvet again. Yeah, yeah, again, yeah, yeah. And and come and get into bed almost with me and be like, are you all right? And I was like, I'm not, I'm not all right. I can't, I don't think I can do this. Yeah. If this is rubbish, I just don't want to live anymore. And it was that bad. And, and when we mixed, the first track that we mixed um, was The Goodwill Out, because it was easy, because it's piano yeah, vocal. Yeah, yeah. Please don't get up, you know, like, you're handing it over to a guy who knows how to twiddle all them knobs. I don't know how to do that. Yeah, so yeah. I just you just hope. So what state was the album in before youth came in? What what was the reason for it youth coming in? It was all recorded. In? Yeah. 
but we'd had it mixed and it sounded really bad. Right. It wasn't right. And Because uh, youth had done, so past, I mean, obviously from Killing Joe, but he'd done, what, Acton Bay, yeah. done Zeropa, yeah. done t James. Yeah, d and he went on to do the Verve. Yeah. Um, so he, he, yeah, yeah, he had the chops. And he's done like Pink Floyd. Yeah. And, yeah. He, he knows his stuff. He's he? brilliant. Yeah. He's a good friend now as well. Yeah. We've, we've been on a journey. We're brothers, man. He's 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 great. But yeah, and and uh, Tony came in, and um, I was like, if this is rubbish, I, I don't think I can go on. And he's like, well, you've done the hard bit. You've recorded it. You've written it. You know, this this bit. You don't even need to be involved in this bit because mm. I used to be like. Getting involved, obviously, you know, like how hard can it be? You know, yeah. if it sounds rubbish, I'll twiddle More those cows. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I wasn't involved in them. I couldn't go in, in the, on the first day until it finished. And at the end of the first day, it was about 10 o'clock, and youth sent someone to get me, right? Come in and have a listen. And it just, yeah. And I was in tears. I was like, oh, thank God for that. It must have been quite a stressful time. I was like, that's what I, that's what I meant. Yeah, that was it. Thank you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> See? I, I told you it was in there. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much that. I knew that I was, was pretty right. Much, was pretty much that. But, um, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, obviously, like, with no appreciation of all the tattered people who were working their asses off around me. But, yeah. You know, age brings that. But at the time, I was just so self-involved is the word. I yeah, mean, yeah. you know. As an artist, you can get like that, and, and it's kind of useful as an artist. But as a human being, you have to now and again pull your head out of your ass. So the songs are <laughs> the songs are quite interesting. I think that's that's part of their appeal as well. Is that you know they they do sound very intimate, and yeah, the yeah, way yeah. that it's performed, the way that it's sung, yeah. you know, especially kind of um, come back to what you know. Yeah, you know, it's you know, it's got the huge anthemic choruses, but they're not. They're not screamed with any real anger. Well, I, I I I used to write everything. With a really sort of gentle, intimate voice, and then you'd sing it, and you wouldn't be able to hear yourself over the drums. Mm. So you'd have to sing a bit louder. Yeah, and that's it, really. I mean, how does it feel? How did it feel, kind of having your words sang back at you? That's that never gets old. Yeah, it's amazing, and in different accents as well. <laughs> so, like in Japan or in America, you know, you hear the accent come back in Germany, and um, yeah, it's amazing. Fantastic. Let's have a listen to it uh, come back to what you know. I'm coming back to what you know of me to think. Everything that you've done keeps you from me. Now I know that I need more time. Come back and let me see your right. I'm coming back to what you know. Cause I know that I need it now. It's gone. Now I know that I need more time. Come back. Whilst, whilst we've got the picture here, uh, take us through the album cover. Because yeah. th th this, this strikes me uh, as, <laughs> as as back in the days when there was budget just to fly around the world to, to, <laughs> yeah. to photograph an album yeah, cover. Yeah, yeah. I think it was like 25 grand to, to get the photos, which like now you could you could probably... Do on an iPhone. Yeah, yeah. fitted a band for like five years on that. Wow. Um, yeah, and I remember uh, Mary Scanlon... Uh, fantastic photographer. She was like following us everywhere yeah. and getting all these like handed shots and stuff, which I'd taken from PJ Harvey. She'd had like uh, Maria, can't remember her last name, but she'd had a photographer who sort of just followed her around. Right, and okay. We didn't want to sort of have post stuff. We just wanted to say, this is what we're like, you mm -hmm. know, I've, I've that. But she had this idea. And I remember this American woman coming up to her and saying, if you want to take a photo, you want to have the sun behind you, not behind them. Like giving, like giving you know, her advice. Advice. Typical She's got like you know yeah. ten grand's worth of photography gear, two assistants, <laughs> and you know like. But this woman with a camera cut. Camera Is it quite phone. early in the day? Because it's not often you see a street that empty in New York. Uh, no, I think it was. I think it was like I think that's sunset. So wow. I think it was like sort of six or seven or something. Um, so 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 it came out. The um, goodwill came out. Yeah, there was no need to be nervous. It, it went did, well. It did, it did the business. Yeah, it, it did better than even we, you know, could have hoped. Yeah, it sort of was a 
it sort of was a vindication, but at the same time, we were then thinking about the next thing yeah. and about that being better. So that must have been scary again. Yeah, oh my God. We just never gave ourselves a break. Mm. Like, we never took the foot off the pedal. We've spoken quite a bit, and you know, mental health is, is a biggie nowadays, yeah, especially yeah. in men. Yeah. But, but yeah. I was reading yeah. an article that you, you wrote or, or were involved in 2012 talking about your struggles with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, pioneers on everything. So, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> what. Um, and that kind of the stuff like that, you know, the difficult second album isn't called that for no reason. It's yeah, kind of, they, they they kind of come more difficult than yeah. The more guys. successful your first one is, the more difficult your second one's going to yeah. be. And yeah, that that was that was tricky, and especially presumably because you 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 um, you were touring that touring the good yeah, way out as well. Yeah, yeah, you, it's it's that thing where you're so busy touring and promoting and and, and sort of giving all your energy to the first album, then suddenly the second. That the need for a second album comes and hits you on the back of the head. Yeah. Like, oh, all right, better get on with that then. But I mean, there's still some stuff on the second album that I'm really proud of, you know. But yeah. it, it took really until the fourth album before we found our feet again, you know. Um, well, I mean, slow and steady has really won the race for you guys as well. <laughs> but it has, though. You know what I mean? You, yeah. You've managed, to, for, for however you did it, in terms of actually taking a breather and pacing yourself yeah yeah you know what you, you we're coming up to the 21st anniversary of yeah of this album. i know i know yeah and and you're but you're still you're still together if, if we if our, if our uh, next album if we release our next album in a couple of years time and it does as well as the last two we'll have had like top five albums across four decades but yeah which, which is almost <laughs> a bg's type stat it's like cliff richard <laughs> yes, also isn't it <laughs> It's mental, and, and also we're the same five people. Yeah, we've not. I think I think there's only really like Radiohead, and there's not really many bands that that have that have got that no. where where they haven't had any membership changes yeah, or yeah. no one's left or or whatever. You know, like it's quite rare. And I think we're all just really, all just really believing what we're doing, and mm. and I enjoy it more now than I ever have. Yeah, I mean, I'm just I, I just you know I mean basically. My job is a constant pat on the back for doing something that I love. Yeah. And back in the day, I never used to appreciate that. I was too busy going get off and you know, <laughs> getting on with the next thing. But now it's like, what a life. Yeah. What a buzz. So when you listen back, so the Goodwill Out. What's your favourite moment on the album? Um, it's probably the the title track, the Goodwill Out, at the end. You know. Um, our, our jazz again. I remember because we used to have a different verse for it. Um, which ended up being, I feel like a sinner, which ended up being a, a, a B-side, somebody better. Um, and uh, he said, chorus is good, and I like the la-la-las at the end, but it's a bit self-indulgent. And then I remember him saying, but the rest of the album's so fantastic, I don't mind. You, you, if you love that, you that's have right, it. That's your gift. And yeah. I was like, that was like a red rag to a bull, I was like, Right, I'll show him. So, so, like, working on it right until the very last second, and then I got the verse, and 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 yeah, I just thought. And the, and the thing about it that is, that I love about it is, it's just, it's more us than anything that we've ever done. I think it's sort of, if you wanted to say what are embrace like, you'd play. I'd play him that because because no one else really does that like that like we do. You know, some of the other stuff you could say is done elsewhere, you know, by Coldplay or not the many Verve people, or, Not many people had a kazoo in the top ten, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> especially, with I, the, especially with the white man with dreadlocks. I blame Gomez for that. <laughs> 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 we just, they were on the same label as us. and, and uh, <laughs> blame, we just, I should blame Gomez. We just, we just thought they were really cool. And uh, we'd like, I wish I was in Gomez. And I think our second album was like us wishing that we were in Gomez. Uh, what's the, is there anything on there you change? What's the one track you'd, you'd go back and have another pop at? I want leave the world. Off? It just sounds like Oasis. You know, it's Richard wrote it, and when he wrote it, it was really raw. It was like the Jesus and Mary chain. It was like, it was like really atonal, dark, like territorial pissings by Nirvana or something. Yeah. It was really dark, and we copped out and sweetened it up and right. read it. And, and I wish we hadn't. And maybe you know when we do the when we do the tour next year, um, maybe we'll play them how it should have been. Yeah. That, that might be fun. I are you going to do it chronologically? Do I don't know. I don't know. I've been asked that. I don't know. Um, I sort of I can kind of see why that might be appealing, but also like I don't like the idea of everybody else knowing what's going to come next. Yeah. You know, I quite like the idea of like you know 
Oh, I remember this one. Remember this one. Whereas if they all know exactly what's coming next, I, don't I thought know. the Joshua Tree tour was good. The way they did, did that. They, did they do well, it? They bookended. They did, but they bookended it with kind of like they came on. I think with did Sunday Bloody Sunday and then into something right. else, and then then did the Joshua Tree as like a, a bit of a bit in the middle, and then came back on and did a couple oh, right. more. Yeah, yeah, it worked yeah. quite well. Yeah. But I see what you mean. It's kind of yeah. like people knowing which one's coming yeah. next. It'd really annoy you if you, everyone starts going off to the bar at the one that you Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah, the next two are rubbish. <laughs> I'm, I'm, off, I'm off for a... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't like that. Uh, Danny, thank you so much, mate. It's, oh, been, it's, been, it's my been pleasure. Fantastic. Thank you for taking that taking that trip. It's a sometimes painful trip. Down yeah, no, it's been uh, a revelation, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very Cheers, much. Cheers, mate. Thank you. It's all about the music. Virgin Radio.